Well, good morning, everybody. You know, this morning I was spending some time looking at this 10-day forecast of temperature anomaly. So this is, again, the European model, next 10 days, comparing it to the historical average. I compare this to the Era 5 data. And what's amazing when you look across the planet is just the kind of extent of the warm air we've got in place right now. And there's only a few places that are really tapping into some cooler than average air for an extended time period. That would be parts of Scandinavia, getting up here into this section of the North Atlantic, parts of Argentina, and then really it's this section of, um, you know, of China. And I was thinking a lot about how the temperature pattern might evolve this winter. It's just something that is going to be critical to a lot of different industries. And I, I wonder, this is the thing I, I wonder the most about. You know, I know we have the QBO in its easterly phase. And we've got a lot of warm water in the North Atlantic and in the North Pacific. And there's an El Nino that's going. But I'm just curious because I've never experienced it in my professional career, the contribution to the Tonga eruption back in uh, January of 2022, continuing just to spread across the, the entire planet in the stratosphere, this much water vapor. And so it just makes me wonder, um, are we gonna have a type of you know winter, or at least next six months that has this underlying factor of such, such a sizable increase of an effective greenhouse gas in the stratosphere, kind of, um, playing havoc with our temperature forecasts. I don't trust any of them going out into the winter at this point because of these these uncertainties. And so just wanted to start you off with something I've been thinking about and uh, I think it's gonna be challenging to kind of put together a really strong forecast for. And one thing we do know is that over the next five days and then day five through 10, we're gonna be watching a lot of heat build into our, uh, excuse me, out of Argentina, but into Brazil. Argentina actually goes on a bit of a, a cooler run here. All these temperatures throughout much of Brazil's main growing areas are at some point averaging up to 10 degrees Celsius above average. So we're talking about daytime highs that are above 40 C. That's about 104 degrees Fahrenheit across a significant portion uh, of Brazil. And as I'm sure we've uh, you've seen and we've been talking about, the precipitation pattern there has really just completely shut itself down. So we're drawing in too much dry air out of the subtropics. There is um, no flow. I mean, it's just not set up properly. And we continue to see that to be a problem here throughout the next uh, eight, nine, 10 days. And it's not even to say that there's a, a stronger signal beyond that to return this precipitation. Many of us in the industry are right now looking for what the trigger could be to get this whole pattern to change. Now, I just want to put out a commentary here about what this might mean. There will likely be a lot of replanted crop in this area just due to poor germination. And as long as it can be done, I think, before November ends, um, then uh, a lot of the soybean crop concern about the yield and, and size of it could still be kind of mitigated. Now, that doesn't mean this crop is going to be just bin busting and massive. This is a problem. Uh, but I think we're not really focusing enough on this. So if you think about these southern growing areas, Parna, Santa Catarina, and Rio Grande do Sul, these are the areas that for the last 60 to almost 70 days now, um, we've just been talking nonstop about heavy, heavy rainfall. And when you look at yield variability across Brazil, most of the north central and, and, and northeastern growing areas, the year vari year to year variability going back to where the data starts is, is relatively low. But down in southern Brazil, it's very high. And this is one of the reasons why that's the case. And even when you look into Argentina and see some of this moisture coming in here, just understand that a lot of this is isolated convective events, spring, big spring thunderstorms, and there are still some regions that continue to miss out. We'll look next week at some of the, the weather stations down here to just kind of clue in on what the recent rainfall has been. But absolute, uh, you know, massive, I think, uh, potential disaster unfolding here with just the amount of rain that's forecast to come in. So uh, I only took you out here, um, you know, to the 17th in the forecast, and we are seeing forecast rainfall amounts going off off my charts here. So over 250 millimeters of rainfall predicted in that time frame. And the other way to look at it is just to kind of get an anomaly map. So uh, if you flip that over to inches, a whole area down here expected to get more than four inches above average, while we're expected to be three to four inches below average to the north. And given the soil type, this is going to be. Um, a, a rough go of it. This is really going to hit a lot of these growers hard and force a lot of early season decision making on, on what to do next. So as I said, we're looking for something that could possibly get this pattern to, to move and adjust. I think a lot of it has to do with some of the big things we've been talking about, like the Indian Ocean Dipole, just grabbing hold of the pattern and not letting go. But uh, as we look forward, I mean, let me blow this up a little bit. I can say there are a couple of things adjusting. The area for which we're getting subsidence is moving farther out into the Pacific. Will it be enough that 
by the end of November starts to increase chances for rising motion. I mean, I've said that how many times now, right? I'm like, oh, look, no, there's there's a chance of getting some air to rise here, but it's not been effective enough to get the moisture to pull back in and around to get Brazil's monsoon really going. So I can't necessarily look at this and call it a major catalyst for, for, for change. And one of the big reasons why we're seeing this spread, you know, to the to the east of these the subsidence is because we've got one of the biggest westerly wind bursts I've seen since really since 2015 showing up here. So where this is all just telling me that the trade winds are just making a big push out into the open ocean. And uh, this is the Pacific. But the dominant signal is right here. The Indian Ocean Dipole has got a firm grip on things and it just continues to be our major player going forward. Now, one of the things that we expected to change and is finally changing is our Southern Oscillation Index. As this big westerly wind burst takes over, the pressure pattern between Tahiti and Darwin is going to respond and the Southern Oscillation Index is going to drop. And all of that, okay, is, is a really good signal to tell me that el typical El Nino-like things are starting to happen now in the month of November that will likely carry over in, into December. And so we need to ask if we do see El Nino becoming the dominant factor as we press forward into the next, let's call it 60 days, what might that mean for, you know, not just North America and South America, but the rest of the world? And um, just thinking about, you know, what we've started on, which is South America, I just want to point out that November and December during these other El Nino years down here did not, um, you know, bring in just a, a, a substantial um, wet bias. So my point to tell you here is that when you look at these negative numbers represented by warmer colors, that we tended to see our better rains south. Uh, and that's flooding right now in southern Brazil and then better rains in Argentina. So if El Nino becomes the most dominant signal uh, and it's partnering with the Indian Ocean Dipole, then the near-term outlook doesn't bring a lot of relief for Brazil. Now, it could mean we could get some time periods of better precipitation, but it's not like a complete flip in the pattern back over to wetter conditions. And I know that the European model has a pretty strong initialization bias, meaning that what it starts with, it tends to carry. But if you look out there from November 15 to December 15, we just noticed that there is a lot of well, very dry conditions north and very wet conditions south, meaning that persistence might win the day with this forecast as we continue to go forward. So a uh, very important situation unfolding in Brazil, and we just need to continue to, to talk about it as we, uh, as we think more on what's happening here. Across uh, the United States, let's look back at the last seven days of total accumulated precipitation. As we discussed, the pattern was going to give us more of a northerly storm track, if anything. And we did bring in a couple of systems that brought in some rain to the Great Lakes, uh, some light precip to the Midwest, but nothing really down south. The heaviest precipitation has been in the Pacific Northwest, where some of the, the foothills of the Cascades and the Olympic Mountains here have really just picked up a, a tremendous amount of moisture. It was too mild really to dump just lots and lots of snow except for at high elevation, but uh, we'll be talking about the evolution of this pattern in, in, um, here in just a few seconds. Okay, some satellite data. Sun's trying to rise here this morning. I'm out here in uh, Pasco and Kennewick, so it's four o'clock or something like that in the morning as I'm recording, but over my normal time zone, the sun just popped up, and uh, as I want to do is I want to take you back to yesterday and show you something kind of interesting here. We had a lot of places across the country dealing with some pretty dense fog, but I did want to point out that, uh, remember all the snow we talked about two weeks ago that just blanketed Montana, North Dakota, but the only bit of it that's left right now is up here in Saskatchewan, so that's about it. So we've melted a lot of that. That's gotten back into the, the surface, uh, into the surface moisture, and that's, that's a really good thing. But uh, Texas, you need to be watching this. This is coming your way. Now, what's important about the way this moisture is getting transported, plus the snow melt up here, is it's going to change this map. All right, we've already brought that soil moisture back up. I'll show you that in a second. But with that plume of moisture coming in here, this is really going to help hit this area that's been so exceptionally dry over the last 30 days. And as we talked about, we do have a deeper trough coming in next week that's going to dip down into California, start to bring in some of the first season rainfall for the southern half of the state. But I do want to show you the latest 40 centimeter or 16 inch soil moisture percentile data. So while we will get some improvement in this area, that's arguably our deepest area in drought in the country uh, down here in Louisiana, Mississippi, this is going to be an area that's likely going to get missed. So we've, we've seen models try to pr over predict rainfall in this area and it keeps backing off and I, I got to be more careful with those forecasts there are just some times you start to see things in repeated forecasts and you know you, you get kind of latched onto it and 
reality is is that uh, I think the pattern's a bit drier in the Midwest than I had led on to in previous forecasts. But take a look at the soil moisture up here. Just really made a major recovery due to a lot of snow melt. All right, what do we got? Let's go ahead and start this off with the high res NAM. We're going to pick this up about 6 a.m. Central Time. And you're going to watch throughout the day today just a, a broad shield of rainfall that's going to spread from Texas all the way over to parts of the Mid-South, even to, to Memphis. Now remember, under this, we've got a lot of cold air that's undercut it. So there is going to be some snow up in the uh, this part of the Rocky Mountains. But getting into tonight, we're going to watch another feature here. We've got a frontal boundary that comes right into the Pacific Northwest. And uh, this will get here late this afternoon and this evening. And we also have some snow showers still across parts of the northern tier of the U.S. getting into eastern Canada. So this is through tonight at 11 p.m. Let's play this out into tomorrow morning. You're going to see that kind of shield of moisture try to move its way all the way from the Gulf Coast uh, all the way here to um, you know the Mid-Atlantic and some snow on the backside. And we're just going to play this through the day on Friday and get into Friday evening as high pressure dives in by Saturday morning. We're going to watch that rainfall finally get into one of the areas that's been just driest. So Friday into Saturday, we've got our best chance of getting some moisture to recover uh, down here in parts of the south. Uh, the wettest area is probably going to be in and around coastal Texas here. I think that's going to be the spot we'll keep a close eye on. I still tell you the story is being told by this hemispheric, northern hemispheric view of the jet stream level winds. And what's interesting about this pattern is overall I'd look at it and I'd say, you know, this is good. We've got we've got flow, you know, coming into you know North America from the Pacific, and there's an accelerating jet across the Atlantic, and I don't see any big high pressure blocking in the northerly latitudes. But um, given the dominance of the subtropical piece of this jet, this leaves a lot of the country out of the best flow, and that's why we see some drier uh, forecasts showing up here. But uh, good news is no large systematic blocking of high pressure in the Gulf of Alaska. So even out there, it's about the 20th, we get another push of flow coming into the Pacific Northwest, and um, we just continue to, to overall see the pattern evolve in a way that the jet tries to retract, but the subtropical component really starts to crank up. So that gets you out there to about the 22nd of November, and we're going to continue to watch what this means beyond that time frame. But in the near term, what it means is no Arctic outbreaks. Uh, it means flow is mostly zonal, meaning west to east, and we'll just kind of see how that plays out in terms of the precipitation pattern. So if we look over the next seven days, uh, the activity across the midsection of the country is just almost nothing. This is a bit of a forecast bust, right? We had thought that by the time we get out here to the 8th, 9th, and 10th, that we'd be seeing um, at least one system coming out of the west that gets over the mountains and cranks up here, but it lost its upper level support and we've trended much drier. So we've seen the south pick up better chances for rainfall. You just saw that a few moments ago. But there is a system coming in late in the time period that's going to hit uh, California with a pretty good hit of moisture here. And I want to show you what it looks like. We're going to look a lot at these graphics uh, as we go forward. This is um, uh, one of the resources I like to use that, um, from the University of California, San Diego, that uh, looks at... Um, uh, it looks at, uh, well, it's vertically integrated water vapor transport. That's what the actual phrasing is, but it's just telling me where these atmospheric rivers are coming in. And as we kind of play the forecast going forward here, we see there's a decent push around the 11th into the Pacific Northwest, and we're going to watch around the 12th, 13th, 14th for a decent low to be starting to form here on the 14th and 15th out uh, just off the coast. And that's the one that's going to spin up and start to deliver the chances of moisture on the 14th and 15th and 16th into the west. Sorry, that just restarted there. So I figured we'd go out and look at it by comparing our models, GFS on the right, European model on the left. And as we just kind of play this forward, we're going to head toward Thursday and Friday. We've seen this in the high-res NAM. Not a whole lot of difference. Got the leftover rain down here in the south, which we know is going to be very heavy in here, right along the Gulf Coast, which is good for some of the very dry areas like around Louisiana. Uh, but as we get into Saturday, we've got push here, mainly snow up in the northern Rockies into British Columbia. And then we'll work on to Sunday and Monday. And we've got another low that's coming out here. Now you're going to notice our next surge of moisture coming down here across parts of the south again into early next week. And we see a really good push in the European model, bringing in some heavy rain right into one of the places that is desperate for it. I'm talking about this part of Louisiana, Mississippi. But as I mentioned out here on the 14th, the attention is going to turn to this system that's in the west. And if you've noticed the entire time, I haven't talked to anything about the Midwest. We tend to have higher pressure. We tend to be kind of out of the best flow. And this area is going to be drier. And actually, the temperatures are really going to just shoot back up. I'll show you that in a second. 
But here we are out on the 15th, and we start to see this low taking shape just off the coast. There it is in the European. Here it is in the GFS. And that low is expected to move its way over the west. The timing's a little different between the models, but it's there. And it's expected to uh, eventually you know, come out into the central part of the United States. Now, I say that with a kind of the remembrance that I've said it before, and these systems have not climbed out of the mountains and done something. So um, we've got to see how this pattern evolves because we're running the risk of being drier uh, into a big chunk of November. And what's important about that is that this area that I just kind of highlighted here is missing out on a lot of this precipitation. Uh, that's climatologically consistent with a building El Nino, that this area is a bit drier in November. I did notice this, and we can't it's not talk about it, but coming out of the uh, Caribbean, the GFS is once again putting out just a massive tropical system in, in mid-November. And just want to let you know that there is some ensemble support for something to develop down here, some tropical low pressure. And where it comes out, I don't know. But the last time the models all forecasted this, nothing occurred. So I, I just keep an eye on it overall. Uh, I do want to mention quickly the snowfall forecast that we've got from the Europeans. So we're still watching some snow spread through Ontario and to Quebec. We have the snow that's coming down this part of the Rocky Mountains, possibly some very light snow later this week, um, well, tomorrow, uh, coming into the Appalachian Mountains right in through here. Very high elevation, not much, but don't be surprised. And then the next thing we'll have to watch is when this system comes into the west. Remember, that's the 14th and 15th. And then we'll see on the 16th, maybe some chance of getting some good snow into the Sierra Nevada. Uh, model trend has been down on this snowfall uh, overall. Uh, in fact, the system's overall strength is down uh, in the newest forecast runs. It's not still an event, but not nearly as strong as originally predicted, but could get some decent snow in through here. Some places may be picking up over a foot. Now, the question we just have is, does the system actually do this? Does it spin up over the four corner states and by the 18th get out here? Because remember, I gave you a prediction that by the end of this month, I expected at least two big you know, big central U.S. storm systems coming through. And, you know, we keep pushing forward and those aren't showing up. So, I, you know, this could be a forecast bust for me on expecting to get these systems to come through. I've got to get better flow in here to make that occur. So we stitch it all together and look at these probabilities and we say the chance of getting less than half of an inch of total precipitation in the next 10 days is highest across much of the Canadian prairie into the northern tier of the United States and a big section of the central plains and Midwest. But we've seen the numbers kind of erode in the west and then the great news down here in the south. In fact, the chance of getting over an inch, this is what it looks like. Probability of over an inch of total precipitation desperately needed in this area. Okay, let's go out there and just get a quick look at week two. One of the things I, I just keep watching for is something like a big ridge to begin to build in maybe the Gulf of Alaska or over the Hudson Bay or Greenland. And even though the heights start to come up here, if you follow the contour lines, it's not like it's a, a massive ridge in this area. But you get out there toward the 22nd and we keep seeing troughs drop into the west. And uh, so there's kind of some hope in this pattern, but is it ever really gonna deliver? Uh, so if we go from here, just look at the, let me go to my weather report I put out every day and just take a look at the week two forecasts. Yeah, they keep showing all this wet and it's in all three of the models, but um, I don't know if it's more like the pattern kind of tricking us into thinking it is going to be than it actually is. So we need to come up with, I need to develop kind of a skill score and, and show it to you so we can always understand if the models are performing well or not. So I'm a bit skeptical until I finally see something getting over the Rockies if you're in the Midwest or in the Central Plains. All right, temperature side of things. I told you there's not a lot of cold air around the world, but we did have a cold front come through the central United States, and it's it's really dropped the temperatures off, 15 to 20 degrees in places, but it's not gonna last long. If you look at our frost threat over the next seven days, it's, it's nothing here that's uh, alarming. I mean, this is what we kind of expect this time of year. So let's go and have a look at what the temperatures are gonna do. Uh, really cold air, try to still move its way farther into New Mexico and Texas. This again is with that front. Just remember, over the top of it, is where all that rain's coming in. So there's gonna be a cold rain event uh, down here. But all the heat that was in the Midwest yesterday is now over in and around DC, Virginia, you know, North Carolina. But it's gonna have a big rebound in the middle part of the country. Here's Friday going into Saturday. That cool air continues to sag. From Saturday into Sunday, broad warmth here all the way to the West Coast while the cool air exits east. And then we get into Monday and Tuesday, and it's a pretty good warm up here in the midsection of the country. As we talked about yesterday, a lot of this is uh, rain cooled air. That's what we got here. Cloud cover, keeping things, you know, five, 10 degrees cooler than average in places. And uh, that's, uh, that's what's going on. 
but I take you out there the next Wednesday and shoot, we're back up to that early fall warmth across a big section uh, of the country here. Longer term, this is the latest I've got on the uh, from the 15-day outlook, five-day sliding window. Let's get you out there today, five through 10 when that heat's coming on, and then day 10 through 15. So again, I, I don't have a strong signal yet to say, drop in this brutally cold air. We may have to wait more than two to three weeks before we see something like that occur. So I'm gonna finish up with one last thing here in the US, and that's just kind of the newest update from the uh, European model. And let's just give it that same time frame we did for South America, uh, the 15th of uh, November to the 15th of December. And I look at this and I, I see some things that make sense to me. And at the same time, I'm like, all right, prove it. I get flow in here to actually make these systems. I've called for two big systems before the month ends. We would need both of them to bring this area back out of the drier pattern that it's currently in. Um, could we continue to get above average precip in California? I, th I think we could. Is it drier in the Northwest? Maybe at times, but it's not shut down. There's no big ridge in, in the Gulf of, uh, well, really up against British Columbia to stop all this. And uh, the wetter conditions across the South, yeah, you keep the subtropical jet going, we're gonna see this. But it's just a reminder, I made a case earlier that we are right now starting to see a whole lot more El Nino-like behavior in the atmosphere. And it could last, I think, until the thing peaks. So if we just think about what that is, this is what November and December looked like during these past El Nino events. And if we just take this off, at least take one of those months off, go just to November, it's just kind of a reminder that November, when there's an El Nino, does tend to be a little drier here. I just thought we could override it because this El Nino is interesting in that we would call it like it's got a traditional look to it. But what is odd about it is cold water here, cold water there, and so much warm water everywhere else. And so normally when you're looking at an El Nino, everywhere inside of, uh, or to the, to the right of that line is all warm. But we don't have that. We've got warmth outside of this. So the PDO and El Nino are out of sync. Indian Ocean Dipole still dominates. So what it means is we've got some interference between our teleconnections that are tough for me to resolve. I've, I've not done a very good job at resolving them. So just want to be transparent on that and just kind of continue to watch this as we go forward. So I'll leave you there and we'll talk again tomorrow morning. Thanks.